All right, students, let's talk about ionic compounds with transition metals. Get out your science notebook, let's get started. Here's the essential question. How do you write ionic compound formulas and names, including transition metals? Now let's go back and take a look at our periodic table, specifically with the charges in there. If you recall, we can use the periodic table to kind of figure out what the predictable charge is for most metals and nonmetals. However, the bulk of the metals, the transition metals and the other metals, as well as the metalloids, don't have predictable charges. And that's because they have kind of a weird deal with their valence electrons and electrons falling to lower levels. That's, that's not including these in green. These elements in green, we do have a predictable charge, but all of the other elements that are transition metals and the other metals in groups three through 16, we would need a little bit of help. So let's talk about variable charges. Transition metals of, and other metals can have multiple natural charges. Their charges are variable. Therefore, in order for you to be able to do these problems, you need to know what their charges are. So we specify charge in transition metal elements with Roman numerals in the compound name. So we need to remember what our Roman numerals are, specifically Roman numerals one through six, which are listed right here. These are gonna be included in the compound name, whether I give it to you or you write it. So let's take a look at a couple of examples here. So here is copper. This copper has a positive one charge. And here's oxygen, and oxygen is a minus two charge. That one's predictable. Copper is going to combine with oxygen within a two to one ratio. You need two of these positive one coppers and one of these oxygens in order to get them to follow the rule of zero charge and cancel each other out. Now, what would we name this compound? We would call it copper Roman numeral one oxide. Remember the Roman numeral represents the charge of this copper, which I gave to you in this problem. Now you can also call this problem copper oxide. If you notice in our Roman numeral list that elements with a charge of positive one or just using Roman numeral one are sometimes optional and not included. Let's take a look at a different example. This copper has a different charge. It's a positive two charge. Remember, transition metals and other metals can have variable charges. Oxygen is still a minus two. It's always predictable to be that charge. So when these come together, this is a one-to-one -one ratio. There's one copper and one oxygen that you need to cancel each other out. Now the name of this formula is a little different than the one above. We call this copper two oxide because the copper in this formula has a positive two charge. All right, I've got a challenge for you. This is a brainstorm. I want you to pause this video right now and see if you can answer this question by yourself. It's a good brain teaser to kind of get you to think about patterns and look for hints and see if you truly understand what's going on. I will give you a hint. You do need to determine the charge of iron in order to find the name of this compound. Did you pause the video and try it yourself? This is your last chance. All right, let's go ahead and help you out if you are struggling. All right, we need to determine the charge of the iron in order to name this. Yes, it is iron oxide, but this iron being a transition metal, you have to include Roman numerals in it, so we need to know what the charge is. Well, I didn't tell you the charge, not directly anyways, but you can figure out what the charge is based on what iron is attached to. We know oxygen is in here and oxygen has a predictable charge. There are three oxygen elements, which I'm gonna represent by these three puzzle pieces. And each of these oxygen elements have a negative two charge. That's predictable on the periodic table. How many irons are there? Well, there's two irons. So I'm gonna have to split this in half and have two irons. So these two puzzle pieces represent our ratio of irons to oxygen. Can you figure out now what the charge of each iron is? Well, if you guess that the charge is positive three, then you'd be correct. Each of the irons have to have a charge of positive three. So the name of this compound includes that. It's iron Roman numerals three oxide because the iron in this problem has a positive three charge. All right, here's a couple of misconceptions that I wanna make sure to, to talk to you about. On the left side, you notice that here's some bad examples of things that students do that are not good. Let's say we were given this problem iron three oxide. Some students try to write a formula that includes Roman numerals. Chemical formulas never include Roman numerals. We only use Roman numerals in the name. Here's another bad use of that 
problem. Um, some students use the Roman numerals to represent how many irons there are. So you see Fe3 because some students take this 3 to represent the number, and that's not true as well. Remember, the Roman numerals don't represent how many irons there are. It represents the charge of each iron in the compound. So the correct way to write this would be Fe203 because this iron has a charge of plus 3. You need two of them, and the oxygen has a charge of minus 2. You would need three of them. All right, just let's brainstorm this a little bit. So remember, we have a general rule for naming ionic compounds. We take the metal first, and then we take the nonmetal, and we end in an ide. What changes or what additions can we add to this rule when we include transition metals? Well, if you said that you would use Roman numerals for the metal charge, then you'd be correct. For example, cobalt would include a charge of positive, if, if the cobalt had a charge of positive 2, we would call it cobalt 2 in Roman numerals chloride, and it'd be COCl2. All right, that's the end of these notes. Now's a good time to review, highlight important information, ponder and ask questions if need, and then summarize that main essential question to the best of your ability. Good luck.